We're in the TechCrunch studio today with Paul Martino and Rich Melman, Managing Directors at Bullpen Capital. Guys, welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. So this is very timely for you guys to be here because I think for the last month or so, people have been talking about Series A crunch or whatever term you want to use. And actually, your guys' operational model, um, in my mind, was well ahead of the curve. Can you tell people just briefly what, what your model is in your fund? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start, Rich. Uh, at, at high level, we saw uh, in about 2008 and 2009, as angel investors and active LPs and other seed funds, we saw that there was just this very vibrant seed ecosystem growing, and the Series A ecosystem was kind of staying the same. And so if you have a vibrant growing seed ecosystem, but uh, somewhat flat in terms of total deals and dollar volume A, there was going to be some imbalance happen at some point in time where a lot of seed companies would have a lot of difficulty raising their next round. Mm -hmm. And we figured there would probably be several or many of those seed companies that would be highly promising companies to finance to get them another six, nine, 12 months to get to the milestone that the Series A company would, the Series A fund would want to fund them with. And so uh, we, we actually have a, a bullpen pitcher as one of our LPs and we're sitting there thinking, we're like, you know, we're going to kind of do for startups what relief pitchers do for starting pitchers. We're mm -hmm. going to come in in the fifth and sixth inning. We're going to get six outs, get the company to a spot where they now have the proof points to get the big fund to come in afterwards, hence the name and the model. Great. And so you, you guys saw this in 2009, 2008? Yeah. Well, we, we, when we started talking about doing a fund, we sure didn't want to just do yet another seed stage fund. Okay. It just didn't make sense from a strategic point of view mm. to any of us to try to be yet, an, you know, to, to go down a route that had been so well So you were so we had, to differentiate. We wanted to differentiate. Yeah. And so the, the act of really talking to people and thinking about this is what led to this, to this kind of strategic decision that this was going to happen. No one was there. And Paul can tell you, he, 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 uh, he went out and started talking to some of his buddies about this. And, and, and at the end of the day, we were actually put in business by somebody who said, hey, I need you now. Now's the time to start. Put up or shut up. And it was, it was, it yeah. was what got us going. And that was Phil Black at, at True. Phil was one of our brainstorming partners on this. And he finally called us up one day. He says, OK, enough of the brainstorming. I have a real life example deal. And it was Christmas time, 2010, two years ago, almost mm -hmm. to the day. Mm -hmm. He introduced us to Alex Bard at Assistly. And he said, look, these guys need to do a small round. They could probably do the A right now. But if they did a small round, they'd be in a better position to make a decision about go big or sell the company six to nine months out. Ultimately, they ended up selling the company to Salesforce for a great outcome because they had raised so little money. Whereas if they had taken their big A or B round, I don't know what the letters mean anymore at this point. <laughs> right. right. If they had taken their big round then, it would have made it very difficult for them to have the acquisition be a desirable outcome. Right. And what Rich is alluding to is, is what we did. The reason we spotted it wasn't that we were in a bedroom thinking so hard about it. We mm. went out and we did a little road show. It was, it was in 09 and, and the beginning of 10. We went out and we talked to Maples and Koppelman and we called up Fred Wilson and uh, me, Duncan, Rich, we went out and we did a road show. We said, so what are you seeing in the market? And what we heard time and time again was those funds were worried about competitive differentiation as more and more money flooded in. So it was clear to us that there would be an overinvestment in seed. Yeah. And so our question became, okay, so what's, the, so what's the white space on the board if that's what happens? Yeah. Okay. And then how did you guys decide um, on the fund size? And then how, how do you create your filters, right? So if there's a huge delta, there's always going to be a delta between number of seeds and things that get to A. Now that relatively has expanded. Um, how did you decide on, on how big the fund would be? Who the LPs, you know, you don't have to disclose who, but like what types of LPs you were going after. And then how do you decide and say yes to Sicily, but maybe no to another company? Well, you know, we were starting a new venture. It, it, it was a different model. Yep. It was unproven. Yep. It was controversial. It was to us very exciting. And so the idea was, hey, let's, uh, let's start small and get deals in the hopper. Let's, you know, prove ourselves a bit. And once we've kind of got this nailed down and people can really understand us, then we'll go and, ex you know, extend the size of the fund. And that's, got it. And that's pretty much what we did. Got yeah, it. and so the original LPs were high net worth individuals who were basically all of our buddies. Got I it. mean, it was me and Rich and Duncan. Yeah. We called up people we had started companies with and said, look, yeah. we have a promising idea. Help us get into business. 
and that, that was the original LP base of Fund One was uh, uh, high net worth friends and family. And I'll give you an anecdote to describe what Rich is talking about, about how we had to figure it out. So at first, we, we knew that there was going to be certain characteristics. They, 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 they didn't need to raise a lot of money. They could hit a milestone. But now, two years in, we're 25 deals in. We said we would do a deal a month. Now we've got a really clear scorecard. Like, for example, yeah. we don't want to invest in companies that don't have product market fit. So originally, we're like, great, well, some of these promising companies will need to pivot to business model two. We quickly figured out there were plenty of promising companies that had already made the pivot, but needed another six to nine months of operating data to be able to get their big round. Got it. You know, the A fund wanted to say, hey, we want to see two more quarters of revenue growth. Right. We're like, that's what bullpen needs to be doing. Got bullpen it. needs to be in companies where we could squint hard and see that they had figured it out, but that the series A slash B players yeah. needed another six, nine, 12 months. Right. So we could invest with high probability in companies that would get over that hurdle, as opposed to, hey, I'm an entrepreneur, plan A didn't work, I, I, bullpen, give me some more money and let's try plan B. Uh, and yeah. that's what we didn't do. Got Natural it. sweet spot, because the, the big guys are thinking, hey, I, I, I got to write a big check. Yeah. And if I put a big check in, I got to do a lot of work and really figure out, is this going to really go or not go? Yeah. And usually there's not enough data at, at, at this delicate period of the seed extension time for that to work. So it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a market demand just sitting there waiting for us to fill. Got it. And so, so one filter, it sounds like the company needs to have product market fit, mm -hmm. right? Um, what else are you looking for? I mean, it sounds like you're almost approaching this as a startup, right? You mentioned that yeah. you had the first couple deals and you're tweaking it, and now you're learning through the process, yep. Yep. right? So it almost starts like, sounds like a startup. Yeah, oh, it does, and it feels like a startup, and, and I think it's why, me, Rich, and Duncan, I think, started 11 companies between us. Wow. And so now that we're the <laughs> GPs of this fund, yeah. it was, you know, to the extent that the day we walk in and feel like we're just managing directors of a fund, I think we're doing something wrong. But to answer the specific question as opposed to just kind of the, the what's it feel like, yeah. our process of running uh, an interview with a company is really very different than I think almost anyone out there because it's so functionally based. Mm. CEO will come in and give us an initial pitch and we'll see, are we domain experts? Does it overlap? Is it in the area? Mm. And then there's pretty much one more meeting and it's that one more meeting that's very different than I think almost anyone else in the business. We say to them, you have 12 months of money what is the milestone at month nine you're going to hit? Come in and show us what your operating plan is for the next nine months. And we're going to, if you have high probability yeah. of hitting that milestone, write you a check. Yeah. One, one of the things I noticed in the limited amount of time that I was privileged to evaluate deals was how few people had operating plans. Mm -hmm. Because you're, and we talked about this a little bit, yeah. you're asking for the money and you almost got somebody to lean in and they go, well, what are you going to do with it? And they go, Good question. Yeah. Good question. Right. <laughs> right. And it almost seems like in your model, that's almost a signal like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> let, let me just say one thing first, and then Rich, please explain yeah. this. To me, in many ways, the use of proceeds slide is the most important slide in the deck for a bullpen funded company. Yes. That slide, and if that slide is not well thought out, that tells me a tremendous amount about the stage that that company is at. Yeah. Paul has a very interesting perspective on that very thing. You know, one of us, our partner Duncan, enormous financial analyst, really can understand the intricacies of yeah. what the numbers have to be and so forth. I'm kind of the guy who, who has to feel like I understand where the market's really going to go. It has to kind of make sense to me. Yeah. But Paul, and, and that's common among, that, that, you can go up and down Sand Hill Road and find that kind of activity in, in yeah. almost every venture guy. The unique thing that, that Paul's talking about is when you, and he, and he was the guy that really forced this in, in, in our partnership, thank God. The, 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 the time you put the entrepreneur on the spot and say, okay, here's the money. Tell me exactly what you're going to do with it, yeah. you know, person by person, month by month. And at the end of the day, when you've spent it, where are you going to be? Where are you going to be? Because where you're going to be is going to tell us whether or not we can get the next round easily or yeah. what the outcome is going to be. And, and that's everything. Got it, got it. So uh, Let me say yeah, one sure, more thing that sure. I think you, you might find interesting. I would say one of the most common sentences I say in meeting pitches is, product development is not a milestone. And it's funny, mm -hmm. I, I probably say that in half of our pitches because the use of proceeds slide for half of the companies is, I'm going to hire three more engineers, I'm going to release these three features. 
Like th those, those aren't milestones. Milestones are, I'm going to have a million users. I'm going to have six customers. I'm going to have three repeat. I guess what you're saying is a milestone, and the, the way you're using the word milestone is really about an external facing metric, not internally saying, oh, we've launched this feature. That's we have right, because what is right. the Series A or B fund going to be looking for? Right. They're not going to be looking for that you can quickly deploy uh, features. Right. They're not going to be looking for the fact that you can hire three or four people. All those things are important, yeah. but they're going to look for you can put points on the board. Yeah. Now, why do you think, I mean, there's probably a hundred reasons why, but I'm just curious. If there's so much seed capital and so many seed investors out there creating this opportunity, for example, for you guys, um, why aren't they getting this kind of coaching and advice right off the bat? Or is it just, is you it hyper-syndicated rounds, the, or is it? I, I think there's a, there's a clear psychology difference between the seed investors and guys who come in later. Right. I okay. mean, I, I use the old story of the Canadian gold mining stocks. There was a very clever guy in the 20s that figured out if you bought the stocks in the winter time when, you know, before the winter set in, and then sold them in the summer, you'd make money. Because as, as, as the winter sets in, and there's no information because the, 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 the mines are shut down because of the cold weather, everybody's expectations start to rise and the price goes up. And then in the summer when everything thaws and you right. get the real information, the prices go down because it was <laughs> disappointing. You know, seed state investing, you can have such great hope. It's yeah. so exciting. And, and the ideas seem so interesting and so yeah. full of life that it attracts that kind of money. Yeah. Seed stage investing is, in general, pre-product market fit. Uh, it might be a promising team or a founder, or it could be a product with early traction. But so, so bullpen is really an interpolation. We, we have some similar philosophy to the super angel ecosystem about yeah. quick decisions, yeah. about the ways that we syndicate our deals. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to almost be the, the, the cheat sheet for the Series A guy. We're going, hey, this is what you're going to see in another exactly. six, nine months. Yeah. You better be able to grow up by that point in time. Yeah. And so that's why our position is really different. We've got to have elements both of a traditional super angel and of a series A, B fund yeah. to be able to make good decisions. So final question I want to ask you guys, and it's slightly different because you guys both have a wealth of experience in and around the valley in technology. You live in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. but spend a lot of time here. So I want to ask you one question, and you've been around here for a long time. So. Pretty much forever. Yeah, right. <laughs> forever. Yeah, yeah, a long time forever. So Don't get me started. Well, just an open-ended question. Last couple of years, how have you seen the Valley change over the last couple of years, coming in and out? Oh, well, the, the biggest difference is, is, is the, the locus of operation being in San Francisco proper versus being in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's so remarkably different. I got out here in 1997 in Bubble One. I started a security company. It was bought by a company in Sunnyvale. Yeah. And all the cool kids were in Sunnyvale and Palo Alto yeah. and Menlo Park. And you, you'd have this, there's this weird email company, Critical Path, that was up in the city. Yeah. Everything is within a four block radius. Now, do you think that's a trend or here to stay? Who, who knows? Yeah. Ne ne next boom bust cycle, it could be somewhere else. Yeah. But for this cycle, yeah. that die is cast, no question Got about it. it. I won't make a prediction about next time because yeah. who knows what next time looks yeah, like. Yeah. But that to me is one of the massive differences this right. time versus last time. So when time. you fly in, instead of going south from SFO, you're constantly just. That's right. And so what we did is we have an office that we inherited from Rich's prior venture fund that's on Sand Hill. And we found that we had to have a different location. So yeah. we sponsored Founders Den. So we had a San Francisco office. Got it. Needed to have a presence. And, and for you, having spent forever here. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I was born here. I was actually oh. born in San Francisco. And I, was, I, I would smell the bread from Philo Farnsworth, the guy who invented television, the entrepreneur who invented television. His grandmother lived in the little flat that me and my family lived in, and she baked bread. And so I, I imbued the spirit of entrepreneurship from, from Philo. Yeah. I believe that. And, <laughs> and my uncles were all, you know, and so San Francisco yeah. was always a hotbed. Yeah. But it's clear, once Hewlett Packard started and yeah. Varian in the, in the early days of the electronics industry, the center of gravity of what ultimately became Silicon Valley moved south until this latest uh, retrend. So my question for you is slightly different, which is, what have you seen, what's the biggest change you've seen over the last five years being in the Valley? I, 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 just, I just think it's, uh, it's, it's been hugely impressive how the lean, this lean investing thing with the kids coming out of Y Combinator and so forth mm -hmm. has corresponded exactly with the time that the big venture funds raised too much money. Uh, and those two impacts together have really yep. shifted the whole attitude and the whole nature 
of, of investing, and, and, and the effects are actually more profound than are even fully visible. I, I, I think that, to me, has been the biggest change. Because, you know, when I was at Intel in the early days, until that period, everything was pretty much the same. The same big names were doing most of the heavy lifting in the yeah. valley, and, and this latest upheaval has just changed everything. Got it. It's great. really profound. Well, congrats on all the success in spotting the trend early, and it'll be great to see what you guys do next.